All right, welcome to the lecture on Carl Rogers' person-centered or client-centered psychotherapy. Um, this is going to be more of a full lecture in class. It was a bit partial. So let's get started on this guy here. Let's get my virtual background more effective. Yeah. Now I know what those actors feel like when they're doing like weird green screen business and stuff because it's just green. So phenomenological theories, um, there are a lot of things that are in common among phenomenological theories. The importance of individual experience and the understanding that subjective reality uh, gives rise to social reality and that that influences physical reality. Subjective reality is very important. It, it's not something you, you can just write off. It's something, well, right now we're in lockdown for you know, social distancing and stuff for COVID-19, for coronavirus, and there are some people around the country who are refusing to do this. Their subjective reality, where they don't see this as a problem, is arguably, arguably going to create uh, a potentially problem, or sorry, potentially problematic. Hello. Potentially problematic um, physical reality problems if a bunch more people get sick because of their behavior. Um, we, we do this all the time. Social behavior is driven by subjective views and perceptions of reality, and that social behavior changes physical reality. So we talked a little bit about existential theory, and the existential theory lecture, I'm gonna, I left this guy off because I don't care. Um, Gestalt therapy, we're not gonna do any of this. You should probably know that it exists, and that Fritz Perls and Laura Perls are big names with it. But here we are, person-centered, client-centered psychotherapy. So some of the stuff they have in common, which I've talked about in the existential ther therapy lecture as well, working in the here and now, not the there and then. So talking about what a client is experiencing right this minute, right this second. And questions saying, what are, you, what are you feeling right now? That's such a therapy question, right? But there's a point. It's to get people anchored in what their personal experience is and get them snapped out of thinking about how they were feeling last week. You don't have all the data from last week. You might remember how you were feeling, but if a therapist asks some follow-up questions, you're not going to be able to answer all the follow-up questions. And more importantly, you're not having that same experience right now. Right now, you are having now's experience. And so if you want to shape the way that you, ch that you um, deal with the world and react to life, then do it now. Do it while life is happening, not while you're remembering what happened in life. So concepts like the self-concept, I think Carl Rogers might have been the inventor of this term, or perhaps he was just the person, the person who really popularized it. Empathy and acceptance are common concerns across different phenomenological theories. Acceptance of reality, what this means is accepting the reality that you personally experience. It's not telling somebody what they should be experiencing. It's not like saying, you just can't accept reality, man. You just can't accept that your team lost the finals. It's not me forcing you to accept my reality. That's not what this ever means. There is no, no objective reality in many ways of looking at things, especially when you get around to social, political, uh, stuff like this, interpersonal experiences. Reality is heavily dependent on our, on our interpretation of events that have happened. And so we're not going to be talking about the therapist saying, no, you're not accepting reality because I see it this way. You're seeing it wrong. No, it's more that you've just told me that you experienced this thing, but now you're behaving in a way that suggests you didn't experience that thing. Let's go back to where you experienced this thing. Let's try and integrate that in here. Let's try and recognize that you had this experience and it's part of your life now. And let's, let's accept the fact that that happened. No, no denying, no avoiding. We work that in. This becomes part of what you do. Now, the client's subjective experience is paramount. You don't question that they had this subjective, subjective experience. You might question whether they're accurately telling you about it. You might question whether they are able to understand it without some more practice. But you don't question what it is. I mean, if you are convinced that, this is, that they just told you about their experience, you don't say, no, -uh. you don't say, well, that's nice, but let me tell you how it really is. And there's all sorts of subtle ways that therapists can do this. We don't do any of them. As, you know, we work toward it. We do it in daily life all the time. So you try very hard to work towards not doing that stuff anymore. 
and overall they were always a reaction to the dominant um, paradigms which is going to be you know Freud with his little goatee and he had probably had ears or something oh come on I was doing Freud and then B.F. Skinner with his horn rimmed glasses and his completely intolerant I am not concerned with any of your feelings mouth poor B.F. Skinner I can't believe I drew him that way um, so let's talk specifically about Carl Rogers theory Carl Rogers came from he graduated or got his PhD maybe something at Ohio State and I was at Ohio State and they have his name up in some places Carl Rogers went here but he was not and, and Ohio State has been a very psychology very behaviorist psychology program for geez almost a century now and but he, that's not really where he came from where he came from was the mental hygiene movement Dorothea Dix that movement he's more associated with that than he is with psychology he wasn't ever like a behavioral psychologist he wasn't ever a dominant like invested in the dominant psychological paradigm of like psychological testing and uh, empirically focused research he was he was involved in this very humanist side of things it's much more concerned with feelings and people's lives and stuff than with getting accurate data and that's the mental hygiene movement where he was trained so that's where his background is. He's developing his theory during the 1930s and the 40s. He starts developing it in the aftermath of the Great Depression. Well, in the Great Depression and then in its aftermath. And it's very much a reaction to psychoanalysis. He, like many other people, thought that psychoanalysis was dehumanizing, that denied people um, dignity, that it denied them a feeling of that, that they could be their own agents for change, that they could become better people, that they could choose their lives. So some of the distinctions that this theory had from previous theories is rationality. Okay, that sounds normal, but the idea that humans can be rational, Freud didn't do that. Freud had us all very irrational. Um, we were driven by this id and this and then the ego desperately trying to like make peace between the id and reality and the id is monster and so in Freud's theory, we're not rational. We're not remotely rational. In um, Skinner's theory, we're not rational because rationality doesn't enter into it when all you're doing is reacting to uh, just your stimulus and your reinforcement schedules and stuff like that. And so humanist theories, especially Carl Rogers, were very much about saying that humans are rational, that we can think and that our thoughts matter and that we can work stuff out. Carl Rogers' theory also invested heavily in the idea that humans are fundamentally good. Now I occasionally question this, but this is a fundamental assumption of Carl Rogers' uh, person-centered theory. People are good at heart. And when you have that assumption, then it automatically leads to this idea, then uh, this analysis, like why do they do bad things then? Because we clearly do a lot of bad things. Well, it must be because something came between our goodness and our behavior. Something got layered on top of it. Something uh, artificial, uh, society, bad parenting. And, you know, Rogers is going to invent his vest pretty heavily in the bad parenting side of things. Oh, that was a bird. And... Okay, Sam, I know I said don't say anything, but do you know what that bird was? No. Sorry? No. Oh, is it a woodpecker? No, I think that was like a cat bird, maybe. No, that's a cat bird. Like maybe a cat bird? Okay. It was pretty loud. It's probably even on the mic. So anyway, that kind of rattling sound we heard. Um, so if people are fundamentally good, then the reason they do bad things must have something to do with something that happened after you were born, after your fundamental goodness came into the world, something changed you. And for Rogers, that's going to be the experiences that you have as a child and as a, and as a young person growing up um, heavily. So your motivation, Rogers suggests that because we're fundamentally good, that we're also driven to self-actualize, to be all that we can be, to be the best human that we can be. And he had some ideas about what that meant. It meant caring for yourself, caring for other people, and being authentic and genuine, which we'll talk about. And he definitely invested heavily in the idea that we have in freedom of choice. Now this re this um, therapy modality has been quite popular with American religion because of this. Now another therapy modality that says people are have 
have fundamental possibilities of, of goodness and developing and stuff is existential theory, but American religion hasn't been so excited about that one, partly because it's European and not American, and partly because it's also pretty explicitly atheist. And Rogers wasn't. Rogers, I don't think he was religious, but he wasn't atheist. It, well, in, in his, the I don't know about him personally, his theory isn't explicitly atheist. His, his theory does not say anything like there's no God or anything like that. It just kind of says people are good, people can choose, people can become better, etc. And that philosophy seemed to fit very nicely with a lot of American Christianity for a while. So a lot of Christian traditions like this theory. Christian therapists, Christian counselors sometimes like this theory. It's very popular. And it it is just a positive view of humans. I mean, look at this. We're rational. We, we're basically good. If we do bad things, someone just needs to help us recognize our inner self that wants to do good things, like something more fundamental that wants to do good things. We're motivated to be the best kind of people we can be, the most honest, genuine, caring people we can be, and then we have the freedom to choose. I mean, this is very positive therapy. So let's talk about this concept of self-concept and how it fits. Yeah, develop the theory a little bit more. For Rogers, the self-concept was critical. Now, I'm just going to quickly define the self-concept. It's all the things that you know or think you know or whatever. It's your thoughts about yourself. Now, this this idea is relatively new. There are people through history who talked about things kind of like this. But to put it all together in one coherent kind of little package that you can dissect and make part of other theories, that's fairly new. That's probably some 20th century stuff then. For Rogers, the self-concept is critical and the self-concept comes from our social interactions. So even though Rogers is not B.F. Skinner, he very much is recognizing that external things change us. So our social interactions change who we are. And those social interactions give us a certain self-concept. Now Rogers is very interested in the idea of um, conditional regard. That's one kind of social interaction that many, many people have had, everybody maybe. And that's when the way people treat you is dependent on your behavior. Now one of the last things we did before we, before I personally went on my personal lockdown, and that was one of the last times I saw you guys in person, was we did that activity where I asked you to talk about uh, a time when you were not at your best, but somebody did not respond to you congruently with that. They didn't retaliate when they could have retaliated. They didn't tattle on you when they could have. They didn't impose the punishment that you deserved. Instead, they were kind and they were generous. And they, they kind of took the high road, you know? For Rogers, those experiences are critical. That we should not be treating people according to their behavior. We should be treating people according to who they are. And for Rogers, who they are is good. Everybody is good at heart. Somewhere inside them, even if they do the most horrifically terrible things in their lives, Carl Rogers would have believed that they are good inside themselves somewhere. So we treat them that way. You always treat them according with who they are, which is, and their potential, which is to be good, good people. Now, conditional regard is the bad thing. That's when you treat people according to how they behave. If somebody does a bad thing, you treat them badly. If you does, somebody does a good thing, you treat them well. And people learn to define themselves by their behavior that way. And many people learn to define themselves as not good people, as not fundamentally good. I'm only conditionally good, and I'm only good if I do really good behavior. For Rogers, this is a terrible thing. And it creates a very bad self-concept, a self-concept that does not help you work with your world and doesn't help you become a better person. Now, your self-concept itself goes on to affect the way you perceive the world, especially how you perceive social interactions with other people. So who you think you are changes how, uh, who you think other people are and how you think they behave. I mean, in my other class, we talk about children with extreme behavior problems. They frequently have attentional biases and perception biases where they, so kids who are, you know, aggressive and bullying, they sometimes look at behavior that other people do that is totally fine, normal, neutral behavior, and they see it as threatening. And then they respond as if it were a threat. So you, Rogers would say that that's partly because of their self-concept. They have a self-concept of themselves as a victim or of themselves as somebody who needs to be tough and take care of themselves or something. And so then they perceive 
other people's actions as being dangerous to them and they have to respond and so then when you're then your actions are based on your perceptions like we act based on what we see and what we understand about the world around us right now we also have our life experience now this isn't my view of your experience this is your subjective experience this is the stuff that you are aware of in your life the way you feel the world the way you see the world and of course we're working on tweaking that and making it more useful and accurate but it's your experience fundamentally it's yours no one else's and so for rogers healthy is this it's when your self-concept fits with your experience and that doesn't mean it fits with my view of your experience. It fits with your experience of your experience, with your life, the way you have lived it, that your self-concept is based on this. If your self-concept is not based on this, that's incongruence. If your self-concept, if you see yourself as a certain kind of person, despite the fact that you've had certain experiences, and for Rogers, almost all the time, you're going to see yourself as flawed, you're going to see yourself as bad, as a rotten person, as no good, as not a good father or daughter or mother. And Rogers would say, no, that's, the, that's wrong. You are fundamentally a good person. So we need your self-concept to fit your experience. Your experience of life is that you are a good person. Your experience is the experience that good people have, right? This is your experience and this is congruence the therapist needs to model congruence or sometimes called authenticity the therapist needs to model this so that the client can learn how to do this and this is the path to self-actualization that being open and honest sometimes it's very painful to be honest about what your experience is telling you and what it's telling you about yourself often it's telling you things that you are a better person than you think you are but frequently i mean rogers isn't going to tell you know, blow you know happy ringo up blow smoke up everybody's butt he's not going to tell people that they are that their actions are good when they are not good he's not going to do that he's going to be authentic he's going to be congruent if somebody says well last night i kicked my dog carl rogers is not going to say hmm yes that's acceptable no he's not he's going to say that's terrible why did you do that why did you kick your dog what do you think the dog was feeling? What, what, okay, let's talk about t kicking the dog. Do you think that was okay? I mean, I'm not sure he would ask all these questions, but he wouldn't pretend like it was fine, right? So your experience does need to influence your self-concept. Your self-concept needs to be an accurate reflection of that. What Rogers is not gonna do is say, because you did that, you're a bad person. He's gonna say, you did that, and let's figure out why you did that, and let's figure out how you can like do it less in the future. And he's going to say the reason you did that is, let's go back, go back, go back, animation, is because you had a certain kind of social interactions when you were younger, or maybe now, maybe your whole life. You were treated in a conditional way. And for Rogers, that's the root of most of the evils. It's the cause of most of the problems in humans is that conditional regard. It makes your self-concept incongruent with your experience, which leads to some terrible behavior. And he believed that making things more congruent was the first step towards self-actualization, which is this long, long path that nobody ever reaches the end of, but it's, it's a goal, it's an aspiration we strive toward, towards being our best self. So this just hammers home this theme that I've talked about here and that I'm t I'll talk about in the existential lecture as well. Subjective perception of reality is more important in many cases than reality. That's, that's why reality up here is crossed out. So not reality, subjective perception of reality. I should make that a meme. I'll work on that. Um, so incongruence, as I mentioned, is when your self-concept does not match your life experience. That's what this is supposed to mean eh, no your life experience and your self-concept conflict and this leads to an, a feeling of threat which leads to defenses very Freudian type defenses denial and you know blaming other people and uh, making excuses and avoidance and things like that there's no unconscious motivations underlying them because like I've mentioned like I've said before a lot of people have noticed that Freud was good at observing human behavior but his explanations for that behavior tended to be, it, to put it charitably, not supportable by science. Um, we don't think that there's an unconscious id in us, but people do deny and they avoid and they blame and things like that. So um, when we feel this threat because our self-concept 
is incongruent with our life experience. This incongruence causes it to, us to feel a, th a sense of threat and to live our life with defenses. And, and it actually makes even worse incongruence because we don't want to see the reality of our experience. We don't want to process that experience and really think about what that means in our lives and how we should treat ourselves and other people. And it leads to what he would call personality disorganization, where we can end up having really terrible pathological personality problems. Now this isn't something we talk about very much in psychology anymore. It was a big deal in the mid 20th century. The Freudians, the Rogerians, they all talked about this stuff. But definitely we still talk about the concept of distress, psychological pain, distress, discomfort. It's pretty horrible. And so for Rogers, this is where depression comes from. This is where anxiety comes from. This might even be where schizophrenia comes from. Later in his life, he, ta he dialed this back. He paid attention to the research showing that this doesn't really explain major mental disorders. And it doesn't, <laughs> and doing the therapy that he recommends doesn't fix them. <coughs> so he dialed back his, he walked back his, his strong statements about this later on. But early on, he was saying this is where psychological disorders come from. And the defenses become part of how you think and feel. Later, he would say, yeah, it's still responsible for a lot of distress and pain and stuff. But it's probably not the reason people get depressed all the time. It's not the reason people have anxiety disorders or psychosis. And it's not going to fix those things to fix this stuff. So the underlying pathology is having conditional positive regard. In other words, people treating you nicely only when you're nice to them. And so for him, the answer is people need unconditional positive regard. And that's very hard. My daughter is right here, and she's the person I love most in the entire universe. And still, I am not always nice to her. Sometimes when she does something that I personally don't like, I am annoyed and snippy and stern and angry. And that's, I try to work on that. It's very hard to give somebody unconditional positive regard. But Rogers would suggest that's what we need to work toward and that will be best for them and for us. He also said genuineness. So congruence, um, authenticity, different names for this stuff. This is how you teach other people to be genuine and authentic and that re reduces the incongruities between their experience and their self-concept. You reduce those incongruities. And now fundamentally underneath everything, and the therapists that I worked with that I respected the most of any therapist and almost as may, maybe more than any humans I've ever known, my supervisors and coworkers for a while, a few years in Ohio, they would say this. This was their mantra, the relationship heals, the relationship heals. And this was Rogers, the relationship heals. For him, everything else is less important than the relationship. The relationship needs to be genuine and unconditional no matter what horrible things the clients have done you still believe that they are good people or have the potential the potential to become good people who do good things absolutely and always so this is a given for Rogers he's not going to change this ever now the critical elements of therapy itself you need empathy and we had a, a team present on uh, developing and expressing empathy, genuineness, which you've talked about, otherwise called sometimes authenticity, unconditional positive regard. Those are difficult to do. They take, they're exhausting, especially if your clients are difficult to like or have done some terrible things. To keep this philosophy and live this philosophy that everybody is good and that everybody has value is really hard sometimes. But in therapy itself, it's not like there's like a manual of, well, there probably are manuals, but Rogers himself didn't say that there was like a manual of specific techniques he used. It's the relationship. The technique is building the relationship with the clients. And then you do whatever you got to do to keep that going and work towards genuineness, unconditional positive regard, all that kind of stuff. So another way to say all this stuff, a person's, who a person actually is, and that's a iffy concept because of the subjective nature of these things. but you know, the more or less objective characteristics of a person plus their environment lead to their self-concept. Now, if their self-concept is harmonious with their experience, in other words, if they're not mentally filtering out parts of their experience, twisting parts of their experience to be something that they aren't really, so they, then they are working towards self-actualization. 
and the experiences that a client has can be subjectively integrated into their self-concept and that's working towards congruence oh I can write or genuineness etc authenticity anyway this stuff down here it's working towards that stuff or it can per be perceived as separate from the self-concept so if your experiences are things that you're constantly kind of pushing into this category of oh that's not me that wasn't me that was you know how have you realized how common it is there's an entire subreddit dedicated to this thing I've, I've learned recently how common it is when public figures do terrible things and then they issue an apology how common is it that they say that's not who we are that's not who I am as a person. That's not who I am. That's not who we are. That's not really us. That's not okay for Rogers. Rogers would say, you could say, you know, you don't want to think that you do that very often. You could say, I don't usually do that, whatever, but you did it. Saying that's not who I am is a way of trying to shove that experience into a separate category and prevent it from changing your self-concept. No, you're a person who did those things. That's who you are. You can't pretend that that's not who you are. Now, you can still become a better person, but it'll be pretty hard for you to work on becoming a better person if you're not even acknowledging that there's anything to work on, right? So, um, you can perceive your experience as just part of your environment and not connected with you. Well, that's not that's never the whole truth we respond to our environment but we're part of that interaction we are half of that environment person interaction so say oh that's just the environment for Rogers that's not accurate and so if we do that we are less genuine less authentic we are prevented working from working towards self-actualization and we're gonna be more psychologically messed up so the things that client-centered therapists are supposed to do empathetic attunement or well, I guess they say empathic attunement you're listening intently lots of active listening skills and trying to see from a client's perspective I hope you remember from the Alfred Adler lectures that this was very important for him as well even though he's not classified as a phenomenological theorist you enter the client's subjective world and you see their world as they see it you don't say I look at your world and let me tell you what you're doing let me tell you what your life is no you say show me your life you explain to me your life and let's keep doing this until you're confident that I actually understand your experience regard acceptance affirmation you're constantly modeling the things that these people have missed out on in their lives unconditional positive regard Here, just one second I need to give someone a hand Bling! all right good unconditional positive regard acceptance affirmation not of everything they do you don't tell people that they're good people just because they did a bad thing you don't tell them their behavior is is good when it's not but you remind them that they are fundamentally good or at least have the potential to do wonderful things and be good people you accept the client as a person you don't always accept their behavior but you accept them and you look for reasons for their behavior you look to understand their behavior from their point of view instead of just immediately throwing your judgments on it so you're not going to judge things from your perspective any more than you absolutely have to and so you're always modeling this authenticity, this congruence or genuineness, which is quite hard and it's painful and it leads to difficult moments with clients, but they're worth it. Over time, you build a better relationship that way. So what you want to avoid, giving advice. Now this seems so weird, but giving advice, there's lots of research on this, it rarely works, very infrequently. The times when advice works, spoiler, are when somebody just needs some very concrete information. So if somebody says, well, it's winter and I'm out of money and my son doesn't have any gloves. Okay, it's not going to be helpful for you to say, how do you feel about not having any gloves? No, it would be helpful to say, Salvation Army has free gloves. It's down on 12th Street. They're open from 8 to 7. Go down there. That's helpful. That kind of advice is extremely helpful. But in psychological, interpersonal kind of matters, it's often not helpful to give advice at all. Making suggestions is often not helpful. These are the things we want to do, though. But offering solutions, persuading, and directing the content of this session. So Carl Rogers has these very warm but tense sessions sometimes. A Rogerian therapist, a person-centered um, therapist. Because clients want more direction 
they're much more comfortable with a therapist telling them what to think and feel and telling them what to talk about. Uh, Carl Rogers and the people who follow Carl, Carl Rogers' advice on how to do therapy, they frequently don't give very much guidance. And this is really uncomfortable for some people. They want more guidance and they're not going to get it from Carl Rogers. Rogers might give them guidance in like, okay, talk more about your feelings, but it's about it. They're, they're going to guide the session. And because Rogers is saying, don't give advice, don't suggest things, don't offer solutions, don't try and persuade them to anything. So as far as directive and non-directive, like that continuum of therapy goes, I mean, client-centered therapy is very non-directive, over, way over on this side. Um, other considerations, client-centered therapy you know, is very verbal. You're sitting in a room most of the time talking. Of course, there are implementations that are more active, but the standard way is this way. It's much more virtual or mental, sorry, I didn't mean to cross that out, than it is real life and behavioral. And you're not usually going out and living your life doing this. You're sitting in a room thinking about living your life. And it's much more in the here and now than it is focusing on the past. Here, let me circle these. Does that emphasize them more, or am I just going to make this more mess? It's pretty messy but I'm just invested in the messiness now. And then as far as the therapist expertise that's required, I'd say it's somewhere between low and high. It's not like you need to have a PhD to do Rogers therapy. You don't at all. We could train people with bachelor's or associate's degrees to be pretty decent therapists this way, and people have done this. I kind of think maybe we should do this, but you can get licensed anyway. But um, it's also not that you don't need to know anything. You need some training. Not just any old schmo can walk in and after five minutes of talking figure out how to do this. It takes training and it takes practice. So you need some expertise, but you certainly don't need to be some sort of uh, exalted expert that has years and years of stuff. So the research on this is not great, but it kind of is. Um, it doesn't do what Rogers initially claimed it did. It does not fix your mental illnesses. This is one of the therapies that I call a placebo therapy, but remember the placebo that I'm talking about is a very good placebo. The placebo is talking to a good friend. A lot of people don't have good friends, especially people with mental disorders. A lot of them don't have good friends because their friends leave because they're uncomfortable. They stop calling, they stop talking to them, they stop inviting them to things when the mental disorders start to have symptoms, when they become depressed or anxious or start hallucinating or whatever it is. So. This placebo is a powerful placebo. It's a hard one to beat. It takes a lot for a therapy to beat this at all. It takes a lot for a therapy to even match it. And Carl Rogers' therapy does as well as placebo. It kind of is the placebo. It's a relationship. As he said, it's the relationship. So this doesn't do more than placebo, but it doesn't do less. And it has some extra, extra benefits. It's a special placebo because Carl Rogers' placebo this method of building relationships turns out is extremely helpful. We talk about the therapeutic alliance. This is Carl Rogers' entire therapy turned into a component of almost every other kind of therapy. Almost any kind of a therapy program that you go to to teach you psychotherapy or counseling is going to teach you Carl Rogers' methods or updated versions of Carl Rogers' methods for developing relationships with clients and dealing with clients in sessions. So whenever you say, you find yourself saying, well, the person wouldn't really say that in session. Or when you get the joke, how many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. I mean, so frequently, we're quoting Carl Rogers. We've integrated Rogers therapy, and we've made it a component of the beginning part of therapy when we're building our relationships, and then we keep it going all through therapy, most of the time. Some behaviorists don't do this. Some other people don't, don't really do this very much. But I would say... I don't know, like 80, 90% probably of therapy training programs in North America are going to teach you Rogers therapy as just, and they might not identify it as, as client-centered therapy. They might just say, this is how you build a relationship and you have to build a relationship with clients. Well, why do you have to? Well, because Rogers said so, but also the research really backs that up. All therapies are more effective with Rogers therapy even behavioral therapies, as I've mentioned before. Even behavioral therapies, the behaviorists claim they have no theories that claim <laughs> behaviorists are kind of like, facts don't care about your feelings, right? Um, but they do, the facts do care about your feelings. So these facts do. Therapy, even be, even hardcore, I am going to put you on an intermittent behavioral like reinforcement schedule to reduce your cravings for cigarettes. Whatever you're doing, everything works better 
if you build a good relationship with your client first. This makes everything better. This is the special sauce in all the other therapies. So if your therapy isn't working, often you can make it better by building a better relationship. And frankly, if you're going to serve the people who really need therapy, and these are poor people, people who aren't getting therapy in any other way, um, and people who are lacking support systems in their lives or have weakened support systems, people who are poor. Poverty causes a lot of problems. If you're having a hard time paying rent, if you don't have enough money to buy food for your family every day, you have a lot of stress, tons of stress as you try and solve these problems and the consequences of these problems. And you probably have stressful relationships with other people. And so people who say, well, some kinds of therapy are just being a professional friend, don't knock that. Being a professional friend, you might be the only kind of friend that client has in their life. Because it's hard to be that kind of a friend when you're stressed out, when you're just trying to survive every day. And so if you're in therapy, maybe this is the friend who you have because you're having all this stuff and you're having some mental disorder symptoms and your other friends just don't call anymore. So technically you have friends, but if you never hear from them, yeah. So anyway, um, research on therapist empathy. I'll leave this up here. In general, high empathy is correlated with good outcomes in therapy. Now there's some questionable mixed results about this, but look at this bottom thing. There have been no studies. Okay, this is a few years old, but I suspect it's still the same. There have been no studies showing that empathy has a negative effect on therapy outcomes. So just, there is no downside to this. You develop therapy empathy for your clients. If you can't do this, you might be harming a lot of your clients' relationships and therefore harming your clients. You're harming the therapy process. But if you can do this, you have a superpower. You can help. Uh, at worst, you do no harm. And at best, you're helping people in a variety of situations. So I think I'm going to... Oh no, I'm not going to wrap it up. There's a little bit more. Things that are negatively correlated with empathy. Therapists interrupting the clients. Um... Is it hot in here? Or giving advice? It actually is hot in here. And reassuring. Isn't that weird? Reassuring people. Because reassurance is mindless. Reassurance doesn't pay attention to what the client just told you. If the client tells you, I'm having a terrible time. Uh, I, I can't get enough food for my kids. And my husband's gone. And I just don't know how this is going to work out. And my aunt has cancer. And I don't know how things are going to go. And if you just say, I'm sure everything will work out. Why? Why did you say that? Why are you sure everything would work out? The client knows that you don't have any basis for saying that. The client knows that it's not guaranteed that everything's going to work out. So the fact that you just said that has weakened your relationship with the client because it indicated that what you say to the client doesn't really respond to what the client said to you. You're not really integrating what the client is telling you. So reassurance, I suppose it could happen in some situations, but just as a general approach, it's a bad thing because it doesn't pay attention to what the client actually is going through. So person-centered therapy is a classic therapy in many, many ways. And one of the ways is it has the classic blind spots. We don't know that it works particularly well in collectivist cultures, for instance. The heavy emphasis on self-concept might not make much sense in collectivist cultures and might not be very helpful sometimes. The therapist needs these skills. Now, honestly, I'll just be deeply honest here. I think I have medium sensitivity, empathy, and relationship skills. Um, medium at best. And that's one reason why I don't think I wanted to be a therapist. I wasn't amazingly good at it. And I always thought I was super empathetic, but <laughs> trying to do therapy for a decade convinced me that I wasn't amazingly empathetic. I was em empathic. I can be empathic. I can demonstrate empathy, but not, I was about to say with the best of them, but I can't. I mean, the best of them do it much better than I do it. Um, I think I care about people. I think I want good things to happen to people, but that's different from being able to do these skills in therapy to actually have and, and express genuine empathy and relationship connection, build, build this therapeutic alliance with clients. These skills, some of them can't be taught particularly well. I mean, in general they can. Wherever you're at, I think you can improve. And I'm a living example of that. The three people I told you about who were my therapy kind of, I don't know, guardian angels when I was trying to become a therapist for a while there, for several years, they worked a lot with me. And they had great, great gains. I 
See, this is as good as it's been, that's what I'm saying. Imagine how bad it was before they got a hold of me. But um, everybody can do better, but some people just start out better and they can be amazing. And those are going to be the best therapists, I think, in general. There's probably exceptions, there's probably some kinds of therapy that don't call for that, but in a general therapeutic vanilla outpatient middle class or lower class therapy sense, yeah, you need this. So clients may resist this non-directiveness, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, oh, this is long already, but it, whatever, I'll take a brief story, you can fast forward. So I was working for several years training master's students on how to become psychotherapists, counselors, in my former school down in Texas. And so one of the things we would do is we would have master's, we would have, um, sorry, we would have therapy practice for them, which turned out to be real therapy. So we'd send flyers all over this school. The school had about 20,000 students. So we put flyers and say, do you want to work on your assertiveness? We decided assertiveness was this very vanilla thing. Who doesn't want to work on assertiveness? It's not a mental disorder or anything. Do you want to work on your assertiveness? Well, you don't have to have any problems at all, but if you just want to improve a little bit, come to these free psychotherapy groups. We'll run them for like six weeks or eight weeks or something like that. So we'd get you know a few dozen volunteers and we'd take the grad students and put them in pairs so they could be co-therapists. And then they would run a group and we would interview people and get them put into the right groups and as best we could. And so one year there were two males with so 90 percent of our of our um, graduate students were females so getting two males together I think they were clustering together because they they missed other men or something but they decided to be co-therapists together and I let them and so they ran a group and they said we've been reading about you know Carl Rogers and Freud and we want to do a real non-directive group and I said okay Let's see how that goes. And so they were super non-directive. So they would go and sit with the clients and they didn't explain very much. They said, we're here to talk about things and go. <laughs> and they would just sit there. And so these eight or 10 undergrads that were in their group would, okay, what do we talk about? And they say, well, what do you want to talk about? Well, what are we here for? We're here for whatever you would like to work on. <laughs> and it would just go like that for an hour. It only lasted like three sessions. And then they had like massive rebellion. So one day they come in and they're doing, they're like, well, what do you want to talk about kind of thing? And one of the guys is like, I don't remember exactly what he said. I watched the videos of this and I talked to them about the aftermath. <laughs> we were watching it kind of fall apart week by week. <coughs> and one of the guys said something like, um, why should we come here if you don't know anything? And they, they kept it straight. They said, well, we are students like you were a little further along but we're here to talk about what you would want to talk about well why did I come here if you're not even gonna give me anything to work on these people don't know anything do they and then within just a few minutes you have everybody yelling at them a couple of people yelling at each other and then people just get up and start leaving in the middle of the session that's kind of terrifying and pretty soon there's only a couple of people left and then uh, they kind of called it and then they tried to contact all the group members and say okay we we're a little we're not giving you much to go on, come back to therapy, but almost nobody did. Like they killed that, that group, that group, nobody wanted to come back to that group. They felt terrible. Plus, once it went into everybody yelling at each other, now they probably felt guilty and ashamed of their behavior and stuff, and they didn't want to go back to the place where they had been, no matter what the therapist told them. I mean, they were, they were very gracious and they said, well, I'm sorry, this is something we tried and we shouldn't have done this. Um, come on back, give us another chance, but nobody would come back. I mean, people are really uncomfortable with that level of non-directiveness. As it turns out, most of the recommendations for almost every kind of interpersonal psychotherapy now involve give people a certain amount of direction, let them know what they're supposed to be doing, give them some guidance. They can handle a certain amount of non-directiveness, but especially early on, they kind of freak out. Um, this is one of many therapies that's best for verbal, self-aware clients. There are a lot of kinds of people who have great difficulty with verbal communication. So people with autism spectrum disorder frequently, uh, it's a minority of people with autism who have verbal behavior on their own and verbal communication. Many can be taught verbal communication using like APA methods, etc. But many won't develop it even with that kind of um, that kind of kind of pressure to develop that sort of thing. And many who do develop verbal communication, they're missing an awful lot of the social nuance, the social reasoning that comes with it. So. Social communication is a big deficit for many people with autism disorder. So there are people with neurological conditions kind of like autism spectrum, spectrum that have a big, hard time with verbal behavior. And then there are people who just grew up in cultural and family situations where verbal behavior isn't a big deal. 
I remember talking to a former therapist friend of mine. He wor- he grew up in Milwaukee, and he grew up very. His name is Fred. He's great. Um, he's about ready to retire now. He grew up in Milwaukee, and he would say, "The guys I grew up with, they were not going to do this stuff." With more swear words is how he'd say. It. And he would say that you know they weren't going to sit down and talk about their feelings. That's not going to happen. And you'll see that a lot. You work in a lot of subcultures, a lot of. Um, like societies within the United States where the men don't show up. Male culture is sometimes um, kind of antithetical, kind of opposed to the idea that you should sit around and talk about your feelings and think about who you are. Now, you're at college, so you probably are pretty good at this, but a lot of people aren't good at it, and sometimes they think it's annoying or effeminate or uh, as a waste of your time. I mean, there are you can spend your time trying to convince them otherwise, or you can do a different kind of therapy with them. And then there are people who, because of neurological conditions, are not going to be able to have much self-awareness. So people with very low IQs, people who have intellectual disability, a lot of people with autism spectrum disorder, introspection is going to be very hard for them, or in some cases nearly impossible. This is not good therapy for clients who have those, those particular ways of thinking. So another big problem, we need more research with non-weird clients. So weird clients, Western educated from industrialized nations, from rich nations, and from democratic nations and societies. So these are, so many therapies have been developed by middle class Americans, basically. We need research on the effectiveness of therapies in other societies. And the more we find research about this, the more we find that our assumptions about work, what works and what doesn't work, they don't hold. Sometimes our therapies only work for us. Sometimes they don't work, even in subsets of the United States, in subcultures in the U.S. that we did, weren't paying any attention to, that nobody was checking on when we were making these therapies. So as we wrap this up, finally, I want you to think about helping relationships. How are they different from day-to-day relationships, and how should they be different? Why should a helping relationship have any differences? I would suggest a starting point is, if they weren't different, then we wouldn't need them. If regular relationships fixed mental disorders and the other problems that people have to come to counseling for, then you wouldn't need counseling. If just living your life and having regular relationships fixed things, then a large number of people would not need counseling because their relationships would have fixed it. They don't always fix things. They can be very helpful sometimes and sometimes fix some things, but obviously they don't fix everything. So therapy relationships in many cases need to be different from day-to-day relationships. So what are those differences? And which of those differences could be beneficial? Carl Rogers therapy is all about the relationship and having a different kind of relationship from the one that most people have had in their lives. Now I'm gonna switch back here. The Sam, Sam, you wanna make a, an appearance here? It's bright sunshine, you're, you're peeking in. Sam, the best Sam. You don't have to stay if you don't want to. Thank you. I'm going to wrap this up and continue to write out this very weird semester. Thanks for every for being here, everybody. Missing stream setup. I just want to 